back with you here. I, I uh, mentioned this morning in Sunday school, some of you were not here, and so I'll tell you this, that through the week I'll be giving you some updates on our, uh, the work, and uh, we'll also, of course, uh, I want to do that because you folks have a tremendous part in our ministry all over the world, and uh, we want to let you know about that. We have just returned from the Philippines. We were in the central part of the Philippines on the island of Panay, and Dr. and Mrs. Jeff Clay traveled with us, as well as a new missionary couple that's going to the Philippines under our mission, the Fox. Dr. Clay is a dentist, and uh, he uh, is from West Virginia. And we carried 12 suitcases, I'm talking about huge suitcases loaded with uh, dental supplies and uh, I didn't know a dentist had to have so many different pliers <laughs> you know but you got to have a upper right upper left lower right lower left middle and all that left-handed right-handed monkey wrenches and everything else to pull teeth and I didn't know that but I've, I learned a lot about uh, dentistry these uh, past few days I, I learned enough to know that God certainly didn't call me to be a dentist. I, I learned that. My official job was I was the number. I, I put the topical on there, and uh, Dr. Clay showed me how to give shots uh, to you know the anesthetic, but I'll have to admit I didn't want to try that. I was afraid somebody would move and I'd break a needle off in their jaw or something, and I could just see that happening. And um, my wife, um, glad she said, honey, would you stand up, please? I hope only one stands. Yes. <laughs> We've been married 37 years and six children. God's blessed us. I was looking for my youngest son to come in. He was driving up from Portland. And something must have, I don't know, maybe he didn't get away in time or something, but hoping Micah would be able to make it. Micah's getting married June the 9th. Married Krista Knaus, and she's from Portland. And uh, he's down there about to commit matrimony just at any time now. Amen. But my wife, I was going to tell you, my wife, she was the pharmacist, and she gave all of the uh, tender, loving care, you know, after the tooth was pulled. And, and uh, this is the only dental clinic, I guess, in the world where you get paid for going to the dentist. We actually lost money. The, the, the children are so cute, you know, and sweet that they just sit there and take it. Clay said, I've never seen such tough people in all my life said I'd have to give them gas and everything else here in the states and and uh, but those little guys some of them four and five year olds were having teeth pulled you know they should have stayed in their mouth many years and uh, they just buckle down there and boy uh, take the whole thing and of course word got around that Dr. Clay was a hypnotist because whenever you he, he would look in your face and then he would uh, in a little bit you would come over to the chair and sit down and then he would pull your tooth and there was no pain well I well I suck it no pain and uh, so they he said he's hypnotizing and of course what he was doing is giving the anesthetic you know being very discreet with that needle boy the dentists are really sneaky you know Hi, how are you today? Good to see you. You know, and, uh, but not, not really. But uh, he was very, very uh, easy, and uh, really they didn't even feel the needle, you know, go in. So he was a hypnotist. If you've got a dental appointment tomorrow, I'll be praying for you. And, but there are 619 less teeth now in the Philippines. And uh, so we had, but the greatest blessing was that dental clinic or those clinics we had seven of them and those clinics will help us to get into some areas where the gospel has not gone the uh, we visited we did a survey while we were there in one particular area and we went through an area where there's 17 villages and we sent out word that we we're going to have a dental clinic and some of the people came for uh, several hours they walked and rode jeepneys and then spent the night in order to get their teeth pulled the next day and um, because of that in these 17 villages where now there's no gospel witness 
we will have an open door to go in there. So where our missionaries, whenever they go in, our Bible school graduates, uh, our burden is to train the national, put the tools in his hand, and then uh, loose him and let him go. And God's a blessing in that, and we praise the Lord. I can tell you more about it as we go. Would you take your Bible and turn to Acts chapter number 8? Acts chapter number 8. Acts chapter 8. In verse number 9, the Word of God says in Acts chapter 8, verse 9, But there was a certain man called Simon, which before time in the same city used sorcery, and bewitched the people of Samaria, giving out that himself was some great one, to whom they all gave heed from the least to the greatest, saying, This man is the great power of God. And to him they had regard, because that of long time he had bewitched them with sorceries. But when they believed Philip preaching the things concerning the kingdom of God in the name of Jesus Christ, they were baptized, both men and women. Then Simon himself believed also, and when he was baptized, he continued with Philip and wondered, beholding the miracles and signs which were done. Now when the apostles which were at Jerusalem heard that Samaria had received the word of God, they sent unto them Peter and John, who when they were come down prayed for them that they might receive the Holy Ghost. For as yet he was fallen upon none of them, only they were baptized in the name of the Lord Jesus. Then laid they their hands on them, and they received the Holy Ghost. And when Simon saw that through laying on of the apostles' hands the Holy Ghost was given, he offered them money, saying, Give me also this power that on whomsoever I lay hands he may receive the Holy Ghost. But Peter said unto him, Thy money perish with thee, because thou hast thought that the gift of God may be purchased with money. Thou hast neither part nor lot in this matter, for thy heart is not right in the sight of God. Repent, therefore, of this thy wickedness, and pray God, if perhaps the thought of thine heart may be forgiven thee. For I perceive that thou art in the gall of bitterness and in the bond of iniquity. Then answered Simon and said, Pray ye to the Lord for me that none of these things which ye have spoken come upon you. Let's pray. Now, Father, I pray this morning that as I preach, I pray, Lord, you'd give me the things that need to be said at this particular time, Father. Lord, uh, guard our mouth and the thoughts now as we look in the Word of God and, Lord, as we uh, think on these things. Father, I pray today if there's one here that's unsaved, they'd receive the Lord Jesus as Savior today. And then, Father, I pray that every child of God here, Lord, we'd grow, we'd learn. Father, our vision would be increased. And, Lord, help us to lift up our, our eyes and look on the fields that are white unto harvest. In Jesus' name I pray, amen. Now, Simon is certainly an unusual individual. I, uh, I used to have some set ideas about Simon. I was pretty certain he was an unsaved man, but... The more I look at this, and perhaps the reason or some of the things I'll give you this morning, perhaps you'll understand why I really don't know. And uh, because whenever we look at Simon, we see so many things about Simon that's kind of close to home, kind of close to us. Whenever our lives touch another culture, our thoughts invariably go like this. And I've heard these things. I've said to myself, uh, when someone goes with us to a foreign culture and right away you hear something like this, they drive on the wrong side of the road. Don't they know if they did it like we did in America, it'd be less confusing? Look at the sticks in that Yanomamo woman's face. How can they pierce their face and put those sticks? Well, they look like a cat. Why don't they just pierce their ears like we do? Look at those charcoal smears across her face. Why don't they wear makeup like the Mary Kay woman recommends? Or, you hear this, rice, rice, rice. <laughs> Why don't these people eat a good, healthy meal like we do? 
French fries, <laughs> lattes, hamburgers, or no electricity? How in the world, world will I ever do my hair? <laughs> or snakes, spiders, and lizards? No, sir, I'm not going there. I'm going to Florida on my vacation. <laughs> of course, they say that not knowing that lightning has killed more people in Florida than all the spiders and snakes and lizards in the Philippines or China ever have, you know. Now, all these things indication that, that when you come in touch with another culture, that you get what, what you call culture shock. And it's very real. And we all think that our way of doing it is the best way. Simply because culture is a part of us. That's the way we do it. And you don't realize it, but wherever you, you know, were born, and wherever you spend your life, you're developing certain values of culture. And so, what will happen is this. You accept Jesus Christ as your Savior. And because all of us are cultural people, and culture is a part of us, and we are the culture, then what we do is we will tend to interpret the Bible and apply the Bible in the light of our culture. Now, actually, the Bible has its own set of values and principles. And they are not American. This is not this is not, even though this Bible is translated in English, and we read it today in English, this is not an English book. You understand? This is not a European book. This book is an Oriental book. This book is not Occidental. This book is Oriental. And... God gave His Word primarily in that setting. Now, the Word of God also stretches far beyond just Oriental lands. This book actually is, is a book of heaven's values. And it's, it's really something because whatever age you're in, when you show up and you hear the Word of God, God's got what He wants you to do at that particular time, in that particular dispensation, that particular age. God's got what He wants you to do, and it's always unique from anything that this world is doing. Anywhere. So, even though the book has the roots in the Orient, just being from the Orient will not mean that you're right. Even though this Bible is in English that I read, and even though God has used this in an amazing way, and we have so much in English, just because we've got the Bible translated into English and thousands of study helps translated into English, and we sing God bless America, it doesn't mean that the American way is God's way. My responsibility as a believer, no matter where I am, is to learn what God wants me to do from His book and do it the way He says, not the way that's uh, prescribed by my culture. And it becomes a battle, and you've got a conflict going all the time because, because what you have to do is you have to evaluate constantly your cultural values by the Word of God. And you have to adjust them accordingly, or else you stumble and fumble along. Now Simon here had given him out to be himself to be some great one. He, he, he's recognized by the people. They said, this man is the great power of God. And, uh, and ev evidently here in, in Samaria, uh, within uh, their culture, this is something that impressed them. This man uh, bewitched the people, the Bible says, and, and uh, he bewitched them with sorceries. This is something within their, 
within their culture. And so whenever Simon saw uh, Philip are, uh, preaching and he saw these people believing the message and getting baptized, the Bible says down in verse 13, Simon himself believed also. Now that's the Word of God. That's what the Word of God said. And I, I don't, you know, I'm not going to make an issue here of whether or not Simon was saved or lost. And I'm not going to make an issue of the receiving the Holy Ghost this morning. I'm not, I'm not interested in uh, having any charismatic meeting here. But what we want to look at today is how Simon saw this, all these things, and how he interpreted, uh, interpreted the matter. And then, of course, what we do with things in the Word of God. Simon said, give me this power. And he said that on whomsoever I lay hands, he may receive the Holy Ghost. This is a spiritual thing. And, and Simon wants to get in on this. And he, he wants to be involved in this. And he thinks that all he needs to do is give some money. And uh, he'll, he'll get this power, this, this money thing. Whenever we get saved... We all, we all kind of use Christianity or use the Lord for our own purposes, to serve our own intents. Everybody does it. You do it. I do it. And we want the Lord to serve us. And so we, we'll, we'll read a passage in the Bible and we'll use it the way we want to use it. Rather than the way God intends for it to be used. Now this is called syncretism. And it's a blending, it's a changing of the original message of God. And you're, you're distorting it by culture. So that over time, here's what happens. You keep the ritual. You keep the form. But you lose the truth of it. Many people sit in church buildings in America today. We have the ritual. We've got the forms. But we don't have the heart of it. We play the Bible tape read by Alexander Scorby. And we think that playing the tape that has some kind of particular power that's going to bless our home and help us. Let me give you an illustration. In Panama, there's a tribal group there that had several new converts. And so the missionary asked the new converts, what do you like most about becoming a Christian? And they said, oh, said, Christianity gives us power words. And this enables us to harm our enemies. All we have to do is go to the prayer meeting and we sit directly in front of this person. And whenever this person wants to curse and whenever we kneel in prayer, they would, we would kneel directly in front of them and we could say these new power words. Redemption. Justification. Salvation. And then they get sick or they suffer misfortune. They had learned these power words and these words had, a, had power in themselves. And by just saying these words, it would produce the result they wanted. Well, I know some folks who put on the Bible tapes and just let the tapes play and without ever really studying the Word of God and applying it to themselves and their lives, they think by just playing the, the tapes, that's going to bless their house. They're going to bless their home, bless their family. Power words. We get baptized. And when we're baptized, I baptize you in the name of the Father, Son, and the Holy Ghost. I baptize left-handed, you know. And uh, 
Folks say, amen, amen. What, what have you said and why have you said it and why would you do it? <laughs> you see, for example, in the Philippines, you can attend preaching services, no problem, but if you come to the heretic church or a heretic meeting, which is a, a, a Baptist meeting, and you come to the heretic meeting and that's no problem, but if you say, I accept what you are preaching, I want to identify myself with you, I want to be baptized. In the area where we work, the Catholic priest then demands that the family have a funeral service, declare that person dead, and no longer allow them to come back to their home. That's what baptism means there. Now let me ask you, if it cost you that, does baptism mean enough to you that you'd still be baptized here? You see, in our culture, baptism almost means nothing. It's a quick dip. We've got the suit for you. You can get it done today, and off you go. Sit home, watch TV tonight. Huh? See, it means nothing to us. Now, we ought to be baptized. And there's nothing wrong with having a quick dip suit. I like that thing where the preacher stands behind the baptistry. That makes more sense to me, you know, that you stand behind. You don't ever get wet. Put on your one of those shark skin suits, a suit coat. You don't change your pants. Don't do anything. Just put them down in there and you change your coats. You go out and everybody says, my goodness, I wonder how he changed his coat so fast. His hair is not even messed up yet. There's nothing wrong with, you know, all that. But I mean, there's something wrong whenever baptism doesn't mean anything. It certainly, in the context of the Word of God, has a different meaning than what our culture in America has made it. What about going to the ball games or uh, whatever you're doing and uh, or going to a funeral service and somebody quotes or nobody knows it enough really to quote it anymore. They read the Lord's Prayer, what they call the Lord's Prayer. You know, I've heard this, I've heard this used at funeral service. Our Father which art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth. In heaven, give us this day our daily bread. There's a corpse laying down there. What in the, are we just using power words? Huh? Before the football game, our Father which art in heaven, now Reverend Flopsnot will come and lead us in the invocation. Let us pray, our Father which art in heaven, hallowed. and God's not anywhere close to the football game and doesn't care what the score is. And doesn't care if you break your fool back. Power words. Let me ask you something. Who's a heathen? That guy in the tribal village in Panama? Or that fundamental Baptist sitting up there at the Mariners game? Her father, amen. Boy, God's surely blessing this team. Hmm. And we got, we got three major things in our culture. Three major things in our culture. And sometimes you have to get away from your culture and see others before you can see your own culture because, like I say, this is a part of you. Now, you might think, where in the world? You're probably thinking right now, where did this guy come from? You think I'm going to come back tonight and be miserable again? I mean, you know. Uh, but blame it, on, blame it on the preacher here. You know, he gets all the blame anyway, and he's, he invites us. Right? Right, brother? He invites us. So it's his fault. If things don't work right, he takes, a, he takes it all. But now, wait a minute. We've got three things. If you, if you stick with me for a while, I, I 
think. I, I'm, I really intend you no harm. <laughs> I want to be a help to you. What we need, we, see, we, we need to see that the Word of God is the Word of God. There's a way that seemeth right unto a man, and I'm that man, and you're that man. And, and, and you know, there's a way that seems right to us, and we got our own way of doing things, but God's got His way of doing things. And it's a, it's a battle, and it's a real, it's, a, it's really, you know, salvation is simple. Salvation is believe on the Lord Jesus Christ, and thou shalt be saved. You realize you're a sinner? You realize you can't pay for your sins. Jesus died upon the cross. He paid the debt for sin. You can go to heaven for free. It costs you nothing. He paid it all. All you need to do is sincerely, in your heart, just receive Jesus Christ as your sin payment. And when you do that, God saves you. Now, but now serving God is something else. Serving God is one of the most difficult things. In fact, I think it's the most difficult thing. Because whenever you get saved, you don't lose anything. You still got your old conniving self with you. You got a new man in there. And you can walk after the flesh, you can walk after the spirit. But boy, there's this battle. And somebody said like having two dogs, you know, if you feed the old man, he's going to get strong. You feed the spiritual man, he's going to get strong. And uh, you got two natures in you. You're a schizophrenic if you're saved. Spiritual schizophrenic. You have on one hand one day you act like an angel, the next day you act like a devil. You know, one minute you'll be singing hymns, the next day you'll be cussing out the guy in front of you, pulling in front of you or something. Well, don't you look at me sanctimonious. I know you do. You, you sing. But we all got in our pants the same way this morning. We didn't hang them on a nail and jump in them. That's for sure. One leg at a time. <laughs> That's the way we did it. And you got the same problems I got. I got the same you got. So we don't have any, you know, holy reverend standing up here. I'm not. I get tired. I complain sometimes. I murmur sometimes. I don't like the food sometimes. I think they do it dumb sometimes. And, you know, but you have to come back to the Word of God. And that's why Paul said, I die daily. You don't just, you get saved one time. But, brother, you don't get your walk straightened out all at once. It is a battle from the day you get saved to the day God redeems this old body. <laughs> brother, you have to, excuse me if I yell a little bit, but that's the way we do it down south. These folks from Louisiana, if they've been to church anywhere down there, you understand, they, they get it right away, you know. Uh, Tabasco sauce and all that, you know, and everything. And uh, crawdads. Those things are good, too. It's getting close to lunch. Now, you have to forgive me a little bit. If, if we were just going to stand up here and mumble, mumble, we, we have... See, I'm, I know now I'm in the West, but you guys got enough, you got enough weird things out here that I ought not even be a surprise to you. <laughs> I mean, good night. Good night. So you can take a little yelling every once in a while. See, so you, you know, it shouldn't be, shouldn't be a surprise to you. And uh, that's why I can do it. Now, in other cultures, I do not. There's some places where, where the culture, you know, if, if meat makes my brother to offend, I'll eat no meat while the world stands, what Paul said. So in some places, we don't, yell like this. But boy, I'm preaching to folks who are hardened and tough and you can take it. Amen. You've been conditioned to it. And, uh, but here it is now. Here it is. First of all, here's something about our, our culture. Our culture, here's a, here's a problem you got. Materialistic. We are materialistic in our thinking and our culture. That's it. Second thing, in our culture, we, we are a prosperous people. We believe that prosperity is very important. And the third thing is this. We are individualistic. We don't get together too well. I mean, we're a free man out in Montana. <laughs> whether you're in Montana or whether you're in Washington, you know, you're still an individual. And you kind of like... I, I saw a guy's plate today, a license plate today, it said, uh, you know, a little frame around it. It said, get in, sit down, sh buckle up, and shut up. You see, that kind of 
reflects that kind of thing. We're, we're individualistic, see. We've got a little buffer zone and don't get in my zone. You understand what I'm saying? And, uh, you know, trespassers, you know, will be prosecuted or something and survivors shot, you know, and all that kind of stuff. You know what I'm, you know what I'm talking about. We, we've got our thing in materialism. I know I'm not going to get through this today, so don't even worry about, you know, say, oh, no, man. We got some folks in church. I pastored long enough to know that I had folks in church who could calculate. They had little calculators, and they could calculate if he's only on point one. Let's see, we've got to go through three more points. I mean, it's 45 more minutes, you know, sitting here. So don't start calculating because I'm going to fool you. I'm not going to keep you that long. And I, what, I, what I usually, the way I usually do it, the way things usually work for me is I get, I get a message and I get about five times more material than I can ever preach in three hours. And so it kind of, you know, most of the time I, the Lord kind of takes care of that thing of sermons for tonight and so on. So tonight, come back and you'll be more miserable, see, than what you're going to be today. I'm going to tell you how sorry we are. I said we are. I'm just, really. Okay? And that's what we need to be reminded of. And we need constantly to evaluate what we're doing in light of the Word of God. Materialism. Uh, things and numbers. That's what materialism is involved with. You know, he who has the most toys when he dies wins. Yep. We, we're concerned about things. And, and we somehow or another we think if we can just get those things, you know. And, and, and things are very much part of us. Now let me use a personal illustration and forgive me. I pastor a long time. We had a bunch of stuff, okay? The way things worked out, we were in the mission work, and, and so my wife was out uh, away. She was on the West Coast out here. I was in Alabama at our house, and I had to pack up everything. So some things had to be, you know, chunk, and some things needed to be packed and stored. And the idea was I was going to store the things and then my wife later on is going to come and she's going to look through them and everything. Okay, so I do all that and it's nothing. It's no problem. I mean, I keep all my rods and reels. I keep all my tools, you know, and everything. All, everything's important. Uh, this old crochet stuff looks a little faded anyway. You know, got that goes. Uh, and all that. I mean, my wife was serious about this thing. She gave me a... She, she even gave me biblical warnings. She, she, she knew me, see. She put a letter to me, and it had, it had, she was quoting from Proverbs on this letter. Anytime anybody uses Proverbs on you, it's bad. You know, you better watch out. And so what I did is I lost that piece of paper, and I couldn't find it. And so I had to just pack, you know, the way, you know, God led me. And, <laughs> and so I began to pack. And I got it all in boxes and everything. Really, I thought I did a pretty good job, you know, of, of this whole thing. But, but, but I knew where the things were that I liked, you know, but her thing. So we went, she could hardly wait to get to the boxes. She went through the boxes, and of course, right away, she noticed two or three things were missing. And what are these things? And to her, those things, you know, meant a whole lot. Of, you know, and I thought, well, I did the best I could do and, and all of that. So we go through another sorting, you know. So she throws some stuff out. I throw some stuff out. We've got a few boxes left. Okay, so we're going to set up a, a little mission kind of office so we're close to SeaTac, so we can go back and forth to Asia, and whenever we're here, we'll have a little place to hang our hat, and we got a trailer up in Port Orchard, and so I'm having to go to China, and I can't do, can't really think of things like that too, so I have to put all those things in the trailer. I make sure all the doors are locked and everything, and off we go. Well, while we're in China, this is just recently now, like you know, about a month ago. Uh, while we're in China, <laughs> some good. Uh, Washington folks, somebody, somebody, must have been from Oregon. Maybe they were from Idaho. I don't know. Maybe Montana. Maybe they kind of over in Montana. That's what it, they broke in the back, and they got in there and just went through stuff and took things away. Now, they took silverware. You know, my wife had an old set of silverware that was there. Of course, that didn't, wasn't worth anything. didn't mean anything to me. But what they did is they, they, they took uh, my telephones. And, you know, I mean, telephones. And, and, uh, and not only that, but they took... The, the VCR, I use that VCR to copy my uh, Bible study tapes on, you know, what time I'm not watching Clint Eastwood. And, and uh, they, I, you see, all of a sudden, I was mad. I mean, I was mad. I would have lost my sanctification had I caught them in there, you know. I guarantee you I would have. I'd have lost my sanctification. 
I would have lost my salvation, but I guarantee you we would have had some kind of thing when, if I'd come in. And, and see, it made, me, it made me mad. I mean, have you, have you ever been broken into? Sure you have. And you know how you feel? You're just, you're just disgusted. I didn't feel spiritual at all. I didn't feel like quoting the Lord's Prayer. I didn't feel like doing anything. I didn't feel like reading. I didn't feel like praying. I just wanted to go to war. You know, that's all I wanted to do. And, uh, but but you, what happened, you see, what I mean is this. I, and, and I began to look around, and I had a couple of knives in there. And, and uh, it didn't matter to me that my wife's, wife, her kitchen knives, I didn't care where her kitchen knives were. I didn't know where they were. Didn't care where the kitchen, but my, my, my hunting knife. Now, that's important. You understand? So what, what was happening here? You know what? Well, God taught me some things in this about these things. See, that was my culture. These things I got. Down in the jungle, down in the jungle, you're going... You load up everything to go in the jungle and you get everything on the boat. And the missionaries, we all have boxes. We've got sacks. We've got all these things. And, and the Indians come out and they've got nothing but a loincloth and a machete on. And they look at you and they laugh. <laughs> you know, you've got all these boxes. <laughs> you know, what you got all those for? See, they're going to just live on whatever comes along. And we'll do quite well and do a lot better than we do. But that's our culture. You've got to have your boxes of junk and everything else materialism everybody here is infected by it if you've been in this country very long you're materialistic and the culture is you get these things and uh, not only do you get these things but you get these numbers how many did you have in church yesterday yes how many did you have saved last year and I went on a trip in one place and I couldn't speak the language I had to depend upon the nationals to translate for me and somebody had the had the gall to ask me, well, brother, how many did you get saved on that trip? I said, man, I couldn't even say hello, much less get anybody saved. <laughs> you know, that's just our culture. Now, believe it or not, there's some places where materialism just doesn't count. Where things, what you've got, and money just doesn't count. Numbers. One missionary that goes into China, he's in, by the way, he's Chinese. He lives in Hong Kong, goes into China, mainland China. And he goes back in the poor villages. And back there in a secret underground church, everybody puts their life up on the line to hear the Word of God. One church affected by American materialism demanded that he establish a church in China or they would not support him. And this man, and I understand why, this man went, he got the little group of Chinese believers together and painted a sign and had them hold up the sign, had Bible Baptist Church, there in an alley, hiding in China, if they had been caught, they would have all gone to prison. But they made the sign and they held it up for the American church so the American church could say, here's our church in China. That's materialism. Instead of staying with the principle in God's book, the culture took over, swallowed it up. Materialism has it. Whenever I travel, I always squirrel away some crackers or peanut butter or, you know, Fig Newtons or something else just in case the Lord's hand waxes short. Understand? So I've got these things squirreled away. I'm in the Amazon jungle. Three or four years ago. So well, it's more than that now. And we were there in an isolated village. The only way you can get into this village is you have to fly in. The missionary plane lands on a dirt strip. No way out. If you try to get out through the jungle, it'll be six months to a year walking through the jungle. No telephones. None of that. The Yanomami tribe uh, is there, and the Yanomami 
stay all around the building all time from daylight until dark. That's their form of enter entertainment is to look at what the missionaries have. <laughs> look at what they drink out of, you know. I mean, they don't use gourds. They get these strange round things. And look at all those things. They don't eat with their fingers. They've got these metal sticks they use to put in their mouth. And, and you know, look at all these things they've got. And a little girl, I'd been there several times, and a little girl, her name's Julia. And uh, that's what we called her. She's about eight or nine years old at this time. She was already a man's wife. They marry young in that culture. As Julia came in, in the Indian room, they always have a greeting room, an area where the Indians are welcome to come in and inside the house and she came in and stood there they had some cassava bread it's a hard bread it's made out of ground a ground root it's dried in the sun it becomes almost like a melba toast the missionary gave julia a piece of cassava bread about like that they had a very uh bad season there and it was very dry there was a drought there was not very much food to eat. Many people were hungry. And there I am sitting in there and I'm watching this. I've got my peanut butter and crackers squirreled away, see. After all, you know, nobody else likes peanut butter and crackers, you know. I mean, I'm... Julia has the little piece of cassava bread and there are other children around. And Julia begins to break the bread into pieces, equal pieces, and give it to each one of the children there. You see, in her culture, to be stingy, to be selfish, and not to share is one of the greatest sins you can commit. And she broke off so they all had equal pieces. Everybody had the pieces, and then they all ate the bread. Now, let me ask you, who was practicing Christianity? more in that house Julia or the reverend doctor with the peanut butter and crackers and I'd already explained it you know they really wouldn't like peanut butter and crackers I mean I, I've got to have something you know they like the jungle food they eat the worms they, they can have the caterpillars I just keep my peanut butter and crackers who was a Christian? You see, whenever you begin to look at this thing, I'd like you to take your Bible, and I'm going to close with this verse. But here's a verse that's going to come right face to face with my culture and your culture this morning. And it's going to slap us right in the face, and I'm going to tell you what we're going to do with it. We are going to explain it away and let our culture change the word of God we're going to keep the ritual we're going to still read the verse but we're going to be able to apply it the way we want to look at 1st Timothy chapter 6 look at verse number 6 but godliness well let's read verse 5 because it says something Perverse disputings of men of corrupt minds and destitute of the truth. Watch it now. Supposing that gain is godliness. They think that when you're materially well off, then that's godly. From such withdraw thyself. But godliness with contentment is great gain. For we brought nothing into this world, and it is certain we can carry nothing out. There's some of you here today who have money in the bank. You've got investments. There are people dying. There are missionaries trying to get the gospel to them. And yet you have, in the light of your culture, you've rationalized that it's fine to keep. You need to eat that because, after all, who else is going to take care of you? 
The Bible says we brought nothing into this world, and it's certain we can carry nothing out. There will be no U-Haul in the cemetery. The next verse, And having food and raiment, let us be very with content. We certainly do change that verse, don't we? One of the missionaries said we gave up all. We came here to the jungle. We have to buy our groceries, uh, supplies, three months in advance. And then only when the weather is permitting can the plane fly in and land in our little dirt strip, bring us the food. And we were down, had no food. We were out of food. The weather was bad. It was rainy season. The plane could not land. And they said, you know, we didn't have any more food. And our children was here. We had the babies here, and they needed milk. And we just didn't know what to do. But they said, we, we went to God, and we said, Lord, you know we're here. Lord, you know our whole situation. We need some food. We need food today. And before they had finished praying, a helicopter sound came across the jungle. And the helicopter, their plane was having some difficulty, and the helicopter landed right there on their cleared dirt strip. And it was a government helicopter that had engine trouble. They had to land. And they said, you don't mind if we stay here until the weather clears up. We'll set a camp down here. And by the way, we've got plenty of food on here. We've got some milk that we've got. And we're going on another mission. We won't need it all. They're going to have to come and redo everything. They'll pick us up later. So, so you know, here's the food. Just help yourself. That's the way God takes care of us. Whenever we get in line with his book, not let things materialism keep us from serving him folks i've just returned from an area of the philippines where there's mountainous region 17 villages and no gospel witness no gospel witness the month before i was in china and in china in an area where over two million people have never heard the name of jesus they will not hear his name on a radio broadcast. They will not see a video. They will not hear a radio show because there are no shows. There are no talk. There's no tapes. It goes out. Somebody must go and tell them about Jesus. God help us that we will not allow materialism to reinterpret the word of God and cause us.